For a project, we're going to code a blackjack game. And we'll eventually code a front end for it where we're going to use a sound player to play some sound effects and um, display some images and things on a, on a graphical Windows form. We can do that in you know between 500 and maybe a thousand lines of code. Um, Welcome to Casino Angelique. And it'll look something like this. Okay. But before we do that, we need to code the back end. And this is a GUI for the RPG game we'll be coding. In this series of videos, I, I want it to be kinesthetic. I, I want it to be project focused. So. Sure, we'll go over our new material and I'll show you guys something, you know, hey, this is how it's used and this is some structure, some object in PowerShell, but if you're going to retain it and if it's going to be useful to you, then you need to, you know, jump into ICE or whatever development environment that you prefer, if it's visual code or, or whatever, but you need to jump in it and start coding a project yourself and only when you start building and debugging the syntax and the logic errors and 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 being creative and you know hey I don't like that I'm gonna change this or I don't like the way you know I don't like the way Carly coded that I'm gonna change that I'm gonna change you know when you start coding your own ideas and being creative and you know creating your own problems and then solving your own problems <laughs> then you know it'll really stick then you will retain uh, you know, a new topic or a new item. So um, the next several videos will be will be dealing with classes, you know, projects that use classes and, and PowerShell. Okay. So let's take a look at this. This is a blackjack game. Okay. And first we're just going to play it. What's your name, player? I'm going to say Carly. Hi Carly, before we uh, start, you should know, activating cheat forces the dealer to display all the cards. Deactivating cheat allows dealer to hide the cards. Okay, so we won't cheat right away, but all right, cheat is set to false. Um, I, I'm, I'll display the instructions. Okay, so I'm gonna hit I and display the instructions. Welcome to Blackjack 1.0 Carly. Blackjack is a short, fast card game of luck and skill. The dealer will start you with two cards from the deck. Your goal is to draw cards to get as close to the number 21 as possible. If you go over 21, you are busted. If you get closer to 21 than the dealer, but not over, you win. And of course, if the dealer gets closer to 21 than the player does, by the time the player stays, the dealer wins. The card values, they're listed here. So deuces, threes, all the way up, you know, to queen, king, and ace. Now aces are special. In the real game of blackjack, an ace can be an 11 or an ace can be a 1. So it's a very useful card to have an ace because normally if, you know, if you if you go over 21, you bust and you lose and the dealer wins. But if you have an ace and you're over 21, you can convert the 11 point value of that ace to a 1 point value. So that can kind of, you know, save your bacon. <laughs> if you're losing a blackjack. So aces are very useful. Um, and in this case, the, the computer will just simply automatically do that for the player, okay? It'll take a look and it'll say, hey, if they're over 21, if they've busted, if they have an ace in their hand and that, that ace is being counted with a, a point value of 11, well, I'm gonna change it and I'm gonna count it with the point value of one instead. All right, so that, that process is coded, it's, it's automated. And this is, you know, the, the fun thing about games is that um, you have to put some thought into it. Um, I don't know if you could call this real AI or artificial intelligence. It's, it's too simple. It's it's not sophisticated enough, I guess, to be called that. But but let's just, you know, we'll, in double quotes, we'll, we'll call this our game AI. At a very simplistic level, I guess, it is a way, you know, we, we have to take the things, the decisions and the choices that a human player would make. And we have to translate that into code to get the computer to play as though it were a human and to react as though it were a human, okay? So that sort of is a, a form of AI, I guess a very simple form of AI, but 
we have to do that. We had to do that for tic-tac-toe. We're going to have to do that for blackjack as well. Okay, come up with a set of rules. So I hit enter to continue. And um, those were the instructions. And then if I wanted to activate the cheat, remember that would just cause the dealer to display all of the cards in their hand. But normally, that's not what happens in real life, right? You go to a casino, the dealer doesn't display all the cards that they have. They keep their cards except for one hidden. Okay, so, but we could turn that or toggle that on and off. So if I hit A, cheat is true. And let me deactivate. Cheat is false. A, cheat is true. Deactivate and cheat is false. Okay. So now why don't we go ahead and play blackjack? Okay. And when we do, all right. So we have a card class, right? Remember that classes encapsulate what something is along with what it does. So you can instantiate it and build and code something that models a real world object. In the real world, you don't separate what something is from what something does. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's all grouped together or encapsulated into that object. For example, um, a cat. A cat is furry, like my cat Gunner is very, very furry. He's very fluffy. His name is Mr. Fluffles um, when we adopted him, but my son hated that name, so he wanted to call him Gunner. So he changed his name to Gunner. But All right, so he has, he has a name attribute, right? Gunner. And he has a a fluffiness attribute. You know, he's fluffy level 9,000, um, you know, his fur and everything. So he has data members, right? But he also has member methods. A cat is not just a collection of attributes. A cat also has a collection of, of functions, right? Behavior. He purrs, so he has the purr method. He scratches my furniture, so he has the scratch method. He throws up on my kitchen table, so he has the vomit method. Um, he, you know, he chews up my computer cables, so he has, you know, destroy computer method. Um, he plays fetch, and he, so he has to play fetch method. He does something cool that I've never seen another cat do. He will jump up in the air in the morning, and he will bounce off the side of the wall all the way down the hallway, flipping back and forth and bouncing. He literally, he's like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. I mean, he's like, bounce, 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 all the I have to video that one day and put it on YouTube because it's it's I've never seen any other cat do that. But okay, ADHD, sorry, but but the point I'm making is that um, a cat, you know, it's a collection of of not just what it is but what it does. Same thing for a human, right? A human would have uh, attributes, data members, as well as member methods. Well, that's exactly what a card is. A card has certain attributes and a card also does certain things, all right? So we write a card class. And we'll take a look at that in the code. But I was wanting to play through this game first just to show you what it looks like. Okay, so dealer shuffles the deck and deals out the cards. And here's my hand, okay? So, you know, luck of the draw or not luck of the draw, but I get a seven of spades and I get a seven of hearts. I got a 14. I better take a hit, I better not stay there. The dealer's hand, well, one of the dealer's cards is hidden. I don't know what it is. The other card is a three of diamonds. So what could that dealer have? Well, potentially, if he has an ace or she has an ace, it could be 14. Um, and I've got 14, so potentially we could have a... So I, I need to... You know, my odds are, if I were to stay at this point, I'd lose, right? So I, I needed to take a hit. So Carly, do you want a hit or will you stay? If we take a hit... Then I get I draw another card from the deck, you know, dealer. So I'm gonna take a hit. All right, take a hit. Carly requests a hit. Carly's hand, seven of spades, and a seven of hearts, and a four of spades. Wow. So 18. I'm gonna follow the dealer rules. That's over 17. And most dealers by most casinos are told to stay if they reach 17 or above, but they haven't busted. I haven't busted yet, but odds are if I took another hit, if I drew another card, I would bust, okay? So dealer decides to take a card. So they have a jack of diamonds and a three. That's a, a 13. Well, what what happened? Closing hands? Huh? What, what's going on? 18. Ooh, they busted. The dealer busted. So now the dealer has to show me their cards. They drew a 10 of diamonds, a 3 of diamonds, and a jack of diamonds, 23. 
So dealer busted. Woohoo! Carly wins this round. This round of blackjack is now complete. Press enter to continue. Okay. So player wins is one. Dealer wins is zero. Most casinos, they kind of let you win at first, you know, to get you hooked, get you to bet lots and lots of money, and and then they and then they, then they take you for all your worth. So let's play again. We'll play blackjack again. And we want to recreate and populate an array um, and instantiate card objects and, and store them in that array, all right, to randomize it and start it all over again. My hand, I have a deuce of clubs and a three of spades. I have a five. I definitely want to take a hit. Dealer has a hidden card. What could it be? Uh, queen of clubs. So a 10. Potentially, they could have 21. And wow, looks like... <laughs> they, totally, they did. They totally wiped. They totally wiped the floor with me. Okay, so me and my measly five points. I never even got to take a hit. Why? Because the dealer had an ace and a queen of clubs, and that's twenty-one. So the dealer has a perfect win, a perfect twenty-one, right? So enter to continue. That round of blackjack is so now it's we're tied. Dealer wins and player wins. You know, who knows how many chips we were betting, but thankfully none. All right, so I'm going to do this all over again. Create another array of card objects. We have to instantiate them. Okay, I have a 10 of clubs, a 3 of hearts, and total point value is 13. I need to, need to take a hit, all right? It's too early to stay. Now, the computer, the dealer, well, I know that the dealer has a 4 of clubs, and then there's a hidden card. Hmm, a hidden card. What, what could they, well, if, well, potentially, if our dealer had an ace, point value of 11, then 15 would be the, you know, that'd be, so even the dealer at this point, um, if they're following casino rules, they would take a another hit. They, they would not stay because they're below 17, okay? So the dealer asks Carly, do you want a hit or will you stay? And I, I'm going to take a hit. So H, to take a hit, I take a hit. Carly requests a hit. Carly's hand, a 10 of clubs, points is 10. A three of hearts, points is three. And a nine of clubs, points is nine. Oh man, I'm busted. Guys, 22, I'm, I'm one point over 21. So in this case, dealer wins, right? Why? Because I busted. And dealer point total was, was only 10. So let's go again. And we're going to play blackjack. This, if, if, if the dealer wins again, you know, I've totally lost. But, all right, I have seven points. The dealer has a nine of clubs. I don't know what else I have. I have a deuce of clubs and a five of diamonds. I'll take a hit. So my total points are 17. Um, and I know that the... The dealer's points, nine and eight. Wow. So they have, I'm, I'm not going to win this one. That card's hidden, right? But they have a nine and they have an eight. So they have 17. They're, they're already matching me and they're going to stay. So, and, and I know that if they have this hidden card, it must be greater than 17. Me, you know, I would normally stay at 17, but... I know that the dealer has more than 17, but they haven't busted yet because we haven't lost, um, or the dealer hasn't lost. So even though I would normally stay at 17, I have nothing to lose by taking another hit at this point because the dealer has, you know, this this nine and this eight are 17, the nine of clubs and the eight of clubs. Whatever the dealer's hidden card is, um, they could potentially have, you know, I guess a two or a three or something but up to 20. So they, they haven't won, they don't have a perfect 21 and they haven't they haven't busted. But me, yeah, well, I gotta, all right. I don't really have a choice, I have to take a hit. I might, probably gonna bust, but let's let's do it. And I busted, 22. And the dealers, but see, down here, even if I would have stayed with that 17, I would have still lost the game because the computer had 20, okay? All right, so. It's just, you know, kind of a, a simple console game. But this will give us a chance to manipulate and use classes 
along with their raids and see how they work together. And also maybe have some fun trying to code game logic, right? A little bit of, you know, very simple, I guess, um, you know, AI or, or game AI. So let's step through the code in this project um, for Blackjack. Okay, and I'll try to blow things up here. So the very first thing we have um, you know, up here in our global namespace, um, these aren't declared global, but they, they're they globally accessible because they're declared outside of any function, so they're not local to a function. And these are basically being utilized as constants, okay? And um, basically a, a, a constant is a variable that you know generally has a, a numerical value like an integer value, and it, it doesn't change. And it's for controlling things throughout the game or throughout your project, your application, as well as representing things um, that have a numerical value, but, but with sort of a programmer-friendly or user-friendly name, okay? So like for the first set of constants up here, the number of cards is 13, number of faces is four, four card faces, number of cards in a deck, 52, the max hand size 20, would never get that big, but I figured it wouldn't hurt to set, you know, I mean, I could easily make that five or something, but number of cards to start with, which is the cards, you know, the dealer deals out two cards to the player and the house limit. And this is, most casinos sort of have a hard, fast rule that um, if the dealer gets 217 or above, but they haven't busted, then they stay. They don't, they don't take another hit or don't, don't take any more cards. And that's sort of a casino rule. So basically, I just made that that 17. Um, that, that's where I got that from. Um, but it's arbitrary. You, you could set your own house limit if you wanted to. Um, that's just what the casinos do. All right, the card values. Deuce, 3, 4, 6, um, 10, Jack, Queen, King, Ace. They all have numerical point values. Um, and the card faces, all right? So these numbers... They'll be used in the program. Their values will be used in various decision structures to sort of code our game logic, okay? Um, but so that, you know, this to, you know, from, from a human perspective, it's not very meaningful. On the other hand, this, well, we can look at that and we're like, oh, okay, well, that's a 10, that's a jack, that's a queen of diamonds, of hearts, of spades, of clubs. Okay, so these are numerical integer values, but we are setting them up as constants in our global namespace up here so that we can, you know, it's, it's, it's more friendly when we begin to code the project. And, you know, if, if, if you name your objects and your variables and things um, well, you, you don't have to add as much comments. I mean, you, you should always comment your projects, right? So that you, if someone else were to read your code, they could understand what the heck you were thinking when you did that. And and even for yourself, you know, you, you might write something and then you don't, you come back five years later and you have to change something or modify something and, and you can't even remember why you did things a certain way or what what it was for. And, and so comment tags can help you with that. But, but also variable names can be very helpful, object names. That's worth a comment tag in and of itself, right? Just writing code that explains itself. And, uh, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people like to show off their obfuscation skills and write super cryptic code. That, um, but honestly, for daily, uh, you know, simple tasks, it's more important to write code that's easy to read, that's not obfuscated, that, that's easy to follow, to use variable names that are logical and that describe what that object is and what that object does, okay? Um, all right, the dealer and the player. Now, here we actually have some true globals, okay? Remember we talked about that in scope, global versus local, but the purpose of these, we need these to persist outside of functions and methods. Remember that a variable declared that's local to a function or method, when that function or method ends, falls out of scope, and that memory is then salvaged and scavenged and recycled. But those values would not persist in memory. But if we assign a value to a global, it's basically like a pointer to an object on the heap or the free store in C++. It will, that object will persist in memory. 
um, until we either stop ice or, you know, or set that object to be null and, and, and clean it up. So in this case, we want these to be global, okay? So a couple of booleans and a couple of integers. And then also the player deal and the dealer deal, we're gonna use these to index our, our um, hand of cards, okay? The player's hand and the dealer's hand. And that's gonna get passed around to different functions. And we could create, you know, lots of parameters in all of our functions and keep everything local and then just pass a copy from function to function. That, that That's one way to do it without having to make these global or use globals. But that can be expensive too, because whenever you are passing arguments to a parameter and a function definition, you're creating copies and that can be expensive in terms of performance. So there's a trade-off. Um, you shouldn't do too many, you shouldn't use too many globals in your uh, applications, in your scripts, your programs, but you also shouldn't be making too many copies and, and passing too many values around. So maybe you have to sort of find a balance there, okay? Um, and then whether or not we turn on the cheat, you, you saw the results of that. Um, display all dealer cards, and that's just used along with the cheat method. And another couple of globals, dealer wins and player wins. We're just going to keep track of the wins, okay? And now what's going on here? You've seen this before in previous videos, and we've used these types of objects before in, in previous projects, right? Here we have three arrays, a deck of cards, a dealer hand, and a player hand. All three of these arrays hold card type objects, okay? And they're declared with the new object. And these are arrays of fixed length, arrays of fixed size, okay? And remember that arrays, you know, they have to all contain the same type of object. So in this case, we have declared them to contain a card type object. Well, there isn't a built-in card data type. It's not like an integer or a double or a string. So here we're going to use our, our new toy. We're going to play with our new toy classes, right? <laughs> we're going to write our own uh, data type and we're going to create the card class. So taking a look at our card class, inside of our card class, right, after the opening uh, curly brace, we have our data members. And here's everything that our card object is, all of its attributes, the face, the card, the point value of the card, whether or not the card is drawn from the deck, it's just a Boolean that we can set to true or false. Um, the numerical value from deuce all the way to ace, and the faces, spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs. Next, we have our constructor. Now, remember what we said, every class has a default and visible uh, constructor. But when you write your own function, like a constructor with the same name as a default one, that's called overriding, okay? So when you write your own function with the same name as another function, you override it. You're overriding that default method or that default function. That's overriding. Well, there's also overloading. Overloading is when you write more than one function with the same name, but to differentiate between them, um, they all have the same name, but they would have different um, numbers of parameters or arguments that get passed in. So that's overloading. Overloading versus overriding, that's a topic for a whole video by itself, maybe in the future. But So be aware that when we write a card constructor, we're over, um, overriding the default card constructor, which is invisible, okay? So we're, we're overriding. But then when we create two constructors with the same name, that's not just overriding, that's also overloading. And overloading, you can do that. You can, you can override and then overload a method or function. So I could have th three or four with the same name if, if I needed them or if I wanted to, as long as each one has to be in some way different for PowerShell to differentiate between them. So they all have the same name, but in this case, this constructor takes no parameters, no arguments need be passed in. But this constructor right here takes two parameters. So two arguments must be passed in. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, 
you know, the purpose of overloading, it's to sort of simplify your code. You know, either way, I know that when I build a card object, when I instantiate it using new object or the new method, I need to place a call to the constructor and that call is automatic. But if I wanted to, um, I could I could do something. I could pass parameters into the constructor. So what this does is this gives me the option. Um, I can call card with no parameters or I can call the card constructor with two parameters. But either way, I don't have to worry about having, you know, card constructor one, card constructor two, card constructor three. I don't, I don't have to worry, worry about remembering all those different names of all those different functions. Um, I'm, I've overloaded it so they can all have the same name, but they take different numbers of parameters or arguments. So does that show you the usefulness of overloading? You're like, why the heck would I want to do that? Well, because you may have certain situations in your code where you need four or five functions with the same name, but each of those functions by the same name takes different types and numbers of parameters of arguments. So that's the purpose of overloading. And remember, overwriting, that's when you are, you know, basically writing over a default method or function by, by writing your own with the same name. Overwriting versus overloading. Again, it's a topic for a video in and of itself, okay? So the constructor that takes no parameters or no arguments, we're going to display creating a generic card object at the console, and then we're going to assign some default values. So um, in this case, the card will be deuce, the face will be hearts, and drawn will be false. It hasn't been drawn from the deck. Now, that's just the initial value of the card. We're gonna use a random number function, we're gonna shuffle the deck of cards, right? Which is an array of card class objects. So we write the card class, we instantiate the objects and we populate the array with them. And then we randomize, randomly go through elements and we draw cards out of the deck. So that effectively is how we'll code a shuffle. So that's what we're gonna use this drawn Boolean for, right? Remember it's a Boolean up here, drawn. So it all starts out as false, hasn't been drawn from the deck yet, right? So you understand those initial values. Now that's the constructor that takes no parameters. Now the overloaded constructor, we're overwriting and we're overloading, <laughs> but that takes two parameters is this one. So I can create a card, just a plain old vanilla generic card, but I can also create a specific kind of card with a numerical integer value and a face integer value. Okay, does that make sense? Same thing, we're gonna display at the console, creating a card object, the card, the face, and drawn will be false. But we're passing in the art as an argument here, okay? This dot the card. Well, that was set to this argument that was passed in here, right? So whatever we passed in, that's what the card is set as. We're going to switch on it, and we're gonna assign a point value to that card based on it's, you know, what it is. So a deuce has a point value of two, a three, a point value of three, all the way down to our face cards. You know, 10 has a point value of 10, a jack and a queen and a king have a point value of 10 and the game of blackjack. And an ace is a special card. An ace has a point value of 11, but if you go over and you bust, you can set that to be one. You can you modify the point value and set it to be one if it is to your advantage. So we'll have to do something special with that one. Okay, so now we're gonna look at member methods. We have a display card method. How does that work? We have a string, right? We're just gonna concatenate our string. A what? We're gonna switch on the card, right? And that was here and the card here, right? So that's, that's a data member of our class. So if we switch on the card, what is it? A deuce, a three, a four, a five, a jack, a queen, a king, an ace, all right? We're just gonna concatenate that to the string. So let's say a queen of, or a king of. We'll say a queen of hearts, okay? And that's just switching on the face. So whatever the value of the face and the card is, when we call the display method, the display member method, it's gonna display, you know, A, and then it, it just keeps concatenating that string 
say queen, and then of, concatenating more, and then hearts, okay? Or whatever card we have. Does that make sense? Okay. And then it will display the point value for that card, okay? And then it's we're just writing that string. Once we do all the concatenation and combine everything together with our switch statements and make our decisions and that logic, then we're gonna write it out to the console to effectively display the card. Okay, so that's our card class. That's the blueprint for our card class. Now we come to our main function, right? And this is where we have the menu when we start the game and see we're invoking it here under our invocations. Here's where we're invoking the main menu right here. Okay, so what do we do? Um, we're going to display some some text at startup. Before we start, you should know activating cheat. We're just telling the player that they have the option to cheat and how to turn the cheat on and off. It's right there in the menu. All right, I won't go over this portion to save time because we've already gone over probably at least five or six times um, how menus work. Okay, but yeah, we we have a string and we initialize it with uh, a value that would not cause it to fall out of uh, the condition necessary for our, our while true loop to continue. And to bulletproof it a little bit, we're just gonna look at the first character. You know, they may type in a word, they may type in piano, or they may type in plum, we don't care. All we care about is P for play blackjack. So it makes our menu a little more forgiving if the player misspells something or mistypes something, if we only look at the first character, that's all we need to make our decision. We could leave, you know, I could shave that off and we could look at the whole string if we wanted to, but then our program would be less forgiving. It would be less bulletproof. You see what I'm saying? So as long as the first character of choice is not equal to Q, all right? As long as they haven't chosen to quit, we're gonna keep in this main menu loop and if they play the game or look at instructions or whatever, when they're done, it'll always come back to this while true loop. It'll always come back to the main menu, okay? So that, that's pretty straightforward, right? And we're just changing the color, you know, foreground color red. And the dealer wins and the player wins. Here's our globals. We're displaying that under the menu. You saw how that works. We're gonna call read host. Remember that to lower method converts everything to lowercase. And that is just to benefit the end user to make, again, our, our program more forgiving, a bit more bulletproof. We don't care if they type in uppercase or lowercase, and PowerShell isn't case sensitive anyway. But if you go to languages like Java or C++ or JavaScript, this will get you in trouble because they are case sensitive. So uh, in this case, we only care about the first character and we want we only, you know, we want it to be lowercase. And if they choose play blackjack, we're gonna call the, the game function. And if they choose instructions, we're gonna call the instructions function. And if they choose activate cheat or deactivate cheat, we're just gonna modify the value of our Boolean, right? Okay. And then if they type some crazy nonsense, then we have a default to take care of that or to handle that. Okay, so that, that's our main menu, our wall true loop. Now let's go look at instructions and then we'll look at the game, okay? So let me look at instructions. Where is our instructions method here? All right, so instructions is a pretty simple function call, right? It doesn't really do anything, doesn't take any parameters or arguments and it doesn't return a value. It's just gonna write host and display all of this, the, you know, the blackjack rules the card points and everything to the console. That, that's all instructions does. And it calls the, the pause method, which is just read host, you know, to get a string input from the user. And we'll say press enter to continue. But in this example, we, we don't care what the user types in. We just wanna pause our program flow and, until they hit enter, until they give us a value. So I wrote a quick function, a helper method called pause. Just remember that even if you don't want to 
to do anything with the return value, you still need to catch it. You should not invoke or catch read host without having a variable catch the value being returned. Because if you don't, weird things can happen. You'll notice your menus will jump out of place sometimes or you'll have extra characters in the data stream. So it's it's you know you can kind of liken it to a baseball breaking a window. You don't want that to happen. So um, in this case, if you're going to call read host for the purpose of pause on program flow, but you're not planning on doing anything with the input, you still want a variable to catch the return value. And in this case, we'll just assign it to null. Okay. All right. So back up to our main method. That covers everything. And then the next thing the player might choose, they might choose to play blackjack, right? So what happens then? Well, here's the game. In the game, we're going to initialize all our globals, right? So if they already played around a blackjack, these globals would have values and they would be persisting in memory by design. And so if they then chose to play a new game, we have to reinitialize these globals to go back to their startup values. You know, whatever they were previously, because the player had already played, we have to restore them to what they were at the state of the beginning of the game. Hence this portion of code here to initialize the values of our globals. Okay, now here, start populating the deck with deuces. All right, so the card type is set to be a deuce. Not a douche, but a deuce. No. <laughs> that wasn't even funny, sorry. Okay, all right, so creating a 52 card deck now. Just, we're gonna add a little dramatic pause, okay? Just, we don't need to, but it's, it's kind of a blur. With console apps, sometimes you wanna add a little pause here and there because otherwise it can be kind of a blur if you do too many things at one time. So we're gonna wait two seconds and let, let the human you know, read the output and catch up, so to speak. So the first thing we need to do in our game logic is build our deck of cards. And remember that we have an array. In this case, an array that holds 52 cards, right? That's the number of cards we declared or number of cards in deck up here in our global namespace. 52 cards, okay? So we have our array and we're gonna use a for loop and, and use the power of a, a repetition structure with an array to quickly create this deck of cards using our card class that we wrote. So card type up here, it starts out as deuce, right? That's the lowest point value and the lowest number card in the deck, okay? And remember that Deuce, three, four, five, these are all, they all just have numerical values. These are just integer constants, okay? Same thing for the faces, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs, they're just integer constants. So when you see that in the code, when you see spades, hearts, diamonds, it's just a number. Likewise, the inverse is true. When we manipulate the number zero, one, two, three, we can designate spade, hearts, diamonds, or clubs, okay? So that's the idea behind a constant or constants. Okay, so we start out with a deuce. We're gonna say creating a 52 card deck now. We're gonna add a little dramatic pause there. Sleep for two seconds. Necessary with console apps, otherwise the console can just be a blur sometimes, so we have to slow it down a little bit. And we have a nested repetition structure, two for loops here, okay, to use with our array of cards. In the outer for loop, we start out, card and deck is zero, and then while card and deck is less than number of cards in deck, that's 52, right? 52 cards. So as long as that's the case, then for every iteration of this outer for loop, every repetition, the inner for loop is going to iterate how many times? Card face is zero while card face is less than number of faces, which is four, remember? Increment the card face. And that'll take us to all of our, our faces, okay? So. What we do the, the first time through, um, card type is deuce, okay? See up here, card type is deuce. And so we're inside this inner for loop and what happens? We take our global, our array, and the index subscript value, all right? Card and deck, which is zero, so right now it's the first element, first subscript value. We're gonna use new object, we're gonna instantiate or build a card object. And we're gonna, we're gonna use the 
second overloaded constructor, we're going to pass in the card type and the card face, okay? What's the card type? Well, we start out, the card type is a deuce, right? And what's the card face? Well, card face starts out as zero, okay? Which is, if we go up here, a spade, right? So in that inner for loop, we'll assign a face value spades to deuce, then a, a deuce of spades, a deuce of hearts, a deuce of diamonds, and a deuce of clubs. Does that make sense? You, you with me so far? You follow? So this inner for loop, that's what's happening, right? It's going to loop four times. Um, and then that's going to, and card type is, it's deuce. We haven't changed card type yet. The only thing that's changing in the inner for loop is the faces, not the cards. So it's going to be deuce and then a deuce of each face, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs. And then finally, we're going to call the display card method. And then something key happens here, card and deck gets incremented. Okay card and deck well what's what's the significance of, of card and deck up here right card and deck started out as zero well card and deck is less than number of cards in deck which is 52 well here we're we're incrementing card and deck it's a post fix increment so we're adding one to it so it was zero now it's one okay so that was you know, uh, each each time. So you know, for those four faces, it would have been so it would have been zero. And then it's going to go one, two, three. So there's four faces, but remember that that fence post or that off by one thing we were talking about with arrays and with looping. So yes, we have four faces, but we don't count them one through four. We count them zero through three. Okay, have to think like the computer thinks. So. That would have been incremented four times in this inner for loop, where we started out at zero, now we're at three, all right? Okay, so zero, that gets incremented to one, um, and then two, and then three, okay? Then what happens? All right, once we've populated the four face value cards, or you know, created the, the four cards with the different face values for these, we get down to card type and we're going to increment it. Well, card type started out as a deuce up here, but now if we increment it, a deuce just had the value of two. But if we increment it to three, now it's a three card. And likewise, in that outer loop, every time we increment it, we're changing it to a different card. You follow? So when it becomes 10, it's a 10. When it becomes 11, it's a jack. 12 a queen, 13 a king, and 14 an ace. So that's how we can numerically sequence through um, all of the cards in our deck, okay? So modify the card type so it goes to a three, all right? Then we go back to our outer for loop, okay? So now we've changed, we've, we have four cards of deuces with the four faces, and now we're on our fifth card. Let me go back here, okay? Well, we're still looping because it's less than 52, right? We're going we're gonna to keep going until we have 52. And now what? Same thing. We're, we're going to generate four faces, right? But this time, instead of a deuce, it's for a three. And, you know, it was zero, one, two, three. And now it's four, five, six, seven will be the index values for the next four face values for our next card. Okay. Same thing. New object. Pass it in the card type and the card face, okay? And then we're going to call the display card method. And we'll just keep looping all the way until we get to, you know, until card and deck is no longer less than 52, right? So when it reaches the value of 52. And then we'll follow it up our for loop. Well, then effectively what we have is an an entire array of card objects, um, deuce through ace, and and each one of those deuce through ace card designations has cards of the four faces, right? Spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs. Okay. Then we're gonna pause for a second. The dealer shuffles the deck now. Now, how do we shuffle? We we have a deck of cards up here, right? We've populated the array. But but how are we gonna shuffle it? Well. That's really just 
a matter of randomizing how we pull cards out of the deck, right? So, you know, we could think of a bubble sort, but then we could randomly sort it. But we just, we need a way in code to simulate shuffling a deck of card type objects. So you know, we need some, we need some randomness, randomness there if we say the dealer shuffles the deck and deals out the cards. So how do we do that? Well, for x equals zero, well, x is less than number of cards to start with. Remember that was two? We set it to be two way up here. Number of cards to start with, cards in our hand. So, and then we're, we're gonna, so for first card and second card, we're gonna draw player and draw dealer. So player's gonna draw two cards and the dealer's gonna draw two cards. So now let's jump to the draw function where we pass in the integer player and dealer as parameters and it takes them as arguments. Okay, so when I go to the draw method, so what happens? We pass on either the player or the dealer and then we're gonna get a random number between what? One and the number of cards in deck minus one, right? Which is, that's our 52, right? 52 cards in a deck. So let's make a random number and that becomes the card. And then while global, we need to go to the deck of cards and make sure that that random number, it's potentially possible that the dealer or the player could have drawn that card and pulled it out of the deck, right? So if that's the case, then we need to make a new random number and keep going until we find a card that has not been drawn, okay? So sort of a bit of recursion there. So while global deck of cards is drawn, you know, if, if drawn is set to true, then we, we can't draw that card from the deck because either the dealer or the player already drew it, correct? So now we're going to go through and in this case, we're just gonna make the random number all over again and pull that card. And we'll just keep recursively doing that until we find a card that has not been drawn to put into either the player's hand or the dealer's hand, which that depends on who we pass down as a parameter to the draw method, right? Okay, when we do that, we have to set the value, the Boolean value of that card to be true can no longer be false. Remember that was a data member in our class? If we go to our card class, right, whether or not it's drawn. Why? Because the next time we draw a card, we need, you know, we can't draw a card that that either the dealer or the player is already drawn and it's, it's in their hand. So we have to set drawn to be true, even though its initial value was false. And then finally, if the hand is the player's hand, if that's who we passed in for an argument, then what happens? Well, here's an array that holds the player's hand, right? And that equals, we need to assign to that array the card object. That, you know, the card object that we drew, the A card being that random card, right? Integer value represents a random card. And this being our deck of 52 cards, our global that allows it to persist in memory. And so we take that and we assign it to what? Player hand. And then this subscript value will get incremented. Okay, player deal will get, so we wanna make sure we don't overwrite that card. So the player, you know, think about it, the player draws a card, then they draw a second card, maybe a third card, maybe a fourth card. Well, we don't wanna replace the card, we want to append, you know, the new card to the old card in the array in the hand. So that's why we're incrementing player deal down here. So here we're assigning the random card to the array. The very first time through, that'll be zero. But then we go down here and it's a postfix increment, right? So then the next card and the next card and the next card. And then the other thing we need to do is accumulate the point value in the player's hand and the dealer's hand. Because that's how we tell someone wins or loses, right? Who's greater than, you know, or, or closest to 21 versus who busts or went over 21. And so the player total is gonna to be equal to the player total plus, and then the point value. We just, we just keep adding that, accumulating and adding that point value to player total, right? And they're global, so they persist. That's if the player gets passed in to draw. But if the computer, you know, if the dealer gets passed in to, to draw, we're doing the same thing essentially, but 
we have to do it to the dealer instead of the player. So the global we use is different and the variable that we use and that we increment dealer deal is different to go to the next card in the dealer's hand. We're taking that random card, we're putting it in the dealer's hand just the same way we put it in the player's hand if it were the player drawing. And we're calculating the point value of the dealer's cards the same way we did with the player and doing the post fix increment to move to the next card in the dealer's hand. Okay. So does that make draw seem fairly straightforward? Okay. So let's go back to our program flow. That's what happens when we draw. And that takes care of getting a random card. And that took care of, of generating all the cards in our deck of cards and populating the array. But, but now, how do we show a card? How do we display a card? And that's where display hand comes in. And respectively, we pass in player and dealer. So let's go take a look at that method. Display hand, what does it do? It takes a hand of cards, either the dealer's hand or the player's hand, and does what? Well, if the hand's the player's hand, we'll display the player's name and their hand. And then the max hand size, I think we set it to 20 up here, right? Wasn't it 20? Which probably could be a lot smaller, but you know, hey, you can play with those values if you want to. It doesn't really matter because after generally three or four cards, somebody busts, somebody loses, somebody wins. Um, okay, but that's sort of a limitation on the hand size. And then if the player's hand and that the element there, right, the card is not equal to null, display card. So we just want to go through the entire array the player's hand of cards and we want to display every single card in the array until we reach the end of the array and then we, we hit a null value and then we'll stop okay so at that point we break and we stop out of this loop <laughs> well it just calls display card remember that method is built into the class remember what that method does display card display card will say a Blank, deuce, three, jack, queen, king, ace of spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs, right? <clears throat> so, and then finally the player name and the player total. Okay, so they will display their total number of points, which we already computed in the draw method or the draw function above. All right, that's for the player. Otherwise, it's the dealer's hand. And we just do the same thing. It's the same logic, but we have to invert everything or we change everything to be the dealer's hand instead of the player's hand. Okay, does that make sense? Same thing. Dealer has access to the same display card method because that method is present and available to every single card object. Whether there are cards held in the dealer's hand or cards held in the player's hand doesn't matter. This is a member method in the class itself. So, you know, we can reuse all that code that's, that's built into our, our class structure. Okay, now, there is, uh, you know, this is the same thing as the player's situation. You know, the, the logic is the same for the displaying the player's hand as the dealer's hand, but there's something different about the dealer that we have to code. And that is that, unlike the player, the dealer can, will normally have one of their cards hidden, okay? And so we have to be able to hide that card. And so how do we do that? Well, hmm, okay, this, this, is, this is how we do that, okay? So dealer's hand, and then this is if dis display all dealer cards, th this is if they're using the cheat, but that's, that's not normal. They have to turn that on. The default, the normal is gonna always be this else block. You know, they have not chosen to cheat, in which case, Instead of doing exactly what we did with the player, we have, to, we have to change it up a little, the logic. We're still going through all the cards in the dealer's hand, max hand size, but, and we're still going until, you know, we hit a null value, until we reach the last card in the dealer's hand. But we change where we start with X, right? X starts at zero here if we display all the cards. But if we're running the game in normal mode without the cheat, we start at one. And so that first card, the one indexed at subscript element value zero, 
it never gets displayed. And that makes the game a little more challenging because the player has to guess. You know, if, if I knew all the dealer's cards, then I could make, I would have better judgment. I could make better calls about whether to take a hit or to stay. But if that first card is hidden from me, then it's more difficult because I, I don't know what the dealer has. You know, they, they might be playing me. Um, so does that make sense? Other than that, you know, logic is the same. And point value. Okay, so we've gone over display hand and draw. And let's go back to our, our main game method, the game. So we populated our array with card objects. We drew the cards. We displayed the hands. And now we have to deal, right? So what happens when we deal? Let's go look at the deal function. Deal. Okay, so we have a compound while true loop condition here. And this whole thing runs inside of a while true loop, right, while we're dealing. So let me go down to the closing brace, but... This entire function is basically a while true loop, you know, minus a few lines of code. So what is the condition for that? While choice is not equal to quit, so the player hasn't chosen to quit, and, remember and says both sides have to be true, and the dealer totals less than 21, and the player totals less than 21, and player stay is equal to false, okay? So if the player reaches 21 exactly, they win, and if the dealer reaches 21 exactly, they win. So we don't want to deal, we want to fall out of the loop. If they go over 21, either the dealer or the player, they've busted. So we still want to fall out of the while true loop. We don't, we don't want to deal anything if either someone won or someone busted and, and they lost, right? The only other possibility is the player hasn't won yet, but they haven't busted, they haven't lost either. What if they decide to stay? And if they decide to stay, then okay, we'll also exit out of this while true loop. Other than that, as long as nobody's won and nobody's busted and the player hasn't decided to stay, we are going to stay locked inside this while true loop for the duration of the game. So this is almost the main game engine right here. This is the main game game loop that runs until we have a winner and we have a loser or the player decides to stay. You follow? Okay, so in this engine, right, in this main game loop, what are we going to do? The dealer asks, do you want to hit or will you stay? And we display a little menu. Hit, stay, quit. We're going to read host, we have to get input from the player, convert it to lowercase, assign it to choice. We could switch on the string if we wanted to, sure, but to do a little bit of bulletproofing, this is by no means totally bulletproof, but we're just trying to make it a little more forgiving, we'll only look at the first character. And that way, if they mistype something or they misspell something, our game won't care. Our game will only care about H, S, and Q, the first character. So it makes it a bit nicer, I guess, for the player, or more forgiving for the player in case they accidentally mistype something. We're gonna switch on it, H, S, and Q. If they hit, we call the hit method. If they stay, we're gonna call the display hand method. Well, we already know what display hand does. The one method we haven't covered yet is hit. What if they decide to hit? And the, the only other Possibility would be invalid input, if, if, or if, excuse me, if choice is not equal to invalid input. And, and if the global player total is less than 21, and if the dealer total is less than the house limit, which is 17, this is for the dealer to take a card, right? The player herself or himself can decide when to take a card. Right? They get to make a choice, but How's the computer going to emulate a human? How's the computer going to choose for itself? Well, two conditions. As long as it's less than 21 and less than the house limit, which is 17, the dealer's going to take a hit. And that's what casinos tell their blackjack dealers. Okay? I have a friend who was a blackjack dealer, and that's the only reason I know that. But <laughs> she was pretty cool. She used to work at casinos. Um, otherwise, what? The dealer decides to stay. So they, they have not busted. They haven't gone over 21, but, um, you know, numerically they have hit 17 or above 17 without busting. And then they would decide to stay and display their hand. Otherwise they hit. 
and the player could choose to hit. So in our program flow, that's the next function we want to look at. But you understand that you know, this is sort of the main game function. This is this is the game engine that keeps looping and repeating as long as we don't have a winner and we don't have a, a loser yet, and as long as the player and the dealer haven't decided to stay. Okay. Now let's go take a look at hit. Well, what happens when the, when the player or the dealer decides to take a hit? Okay, we're gonna call the draw method. And remember what draw does? We already covered draw, but it just draws a random card from the deck and keeps going through the deck, iterating through that array of all the cards in the deck till it finds a card that has not been drawn. So it's a random card. That's what hit is. So they draw a random card, whoever, it could be the player, it could be the dealer, depends on who we pass in as an argument. If whoever is the player, well, if the player, as long as they haven't busted, gone over 21, and then for their hand size, what do we need to do? One of the things we need to do, we need to cut our logic so that if they've gone over 21 and they've busted, and if they have an ace in their hand, we need to convert the point value from 11 to 1. Remember we said we'd automatically do that for them? So that's what we're doing. We're, you know, um, if it's greater than 21, oh, they've busted, they've lost, unless they have an ace. Well, we're going to go through all the cards in their hand in this, this for loop here. And until we get to the last card, and you know, as long as it's not equal to null. And then if the card, if the face value is an ace, your hand is over 21, but an ace is found, we'll say at the console. We'll convert ace from 11 points to one point. And so normally the point value for an ace would be 11 by default, but now we set it to one in the player's favor. But also, if we change this to dealer, same thing, right? We need to allow the dealer's ace to become one point as well. So this is if whoever is equal to the player. And we're just recalculating or, or recounting the point value here, okay? So if we do that, we, we set the value to be one, it was 11. We're gonna go through all of the cards in the hand until we reach null, the end of the hand. And we're gonna accumulate the point value of the cards. Now with ace being one, instead of ace being 11, okay? And that's if whoever is the player. But if not, I can't even spell there. I, Player, sorry, but <laughs> platter, player. Maybe I was hungry, you know. I'm always hungry. Okay, so otherwise, it's not the player, then it, it's the dealer. Well, if the dealer busts, if they're greater than 21, I went out of space there, we need to go through all the cards in their hand until we reach the last card. And if the dealer has an ace and they've busted, we're going to convert the point value from 11. We're going to set the point value to 1. And we need to recount all the cards. Now, now that we've done that, we have to do the same thing for the dealer, right? We have to go through all the cards in their hand and accumulate the value. But now with Ace having a point value of one, instead of having a point value of 11. And then we display the hand of whoever. Remember that just goes through all the cards in, in the array, the player's hand array or the dealer's hand array, depending on who gets passed on as the argument, and displays those cards, okay? All right, so back to our the game function up here. So we've gone through populating the cards, drawing the first two, displaying the hand, deal. You know, our main game loop keeps everything going and drawing cards until someone loses, someone wins, or someone stays. Finally, we get to the end, closing hands, right? Someone stayed, someone won, someone lost. Display hand, player, display hand, dealer. And then what are the possibilities? If the player is 21, player nails it and one, perfect 21. If the dealer, dealer nails it, perfect 21. Um, if the player is greater than the 21, the player busted. If the dealer is greater than 21, the dealer busted. Not a syntax error, but I, I don't like that. I, I don't like sloppy code. I like to have neat code. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, finally down here. If player stay, player stays, let's see whose hand is better. So if 
very unlikely, but potentially possible that the player and the dealer might have the same point value when the player decides to stay. If so, unbelievable, the player and the dealer tie, right? Otherwise, if the player decides to stay and, um, you know, if, if the player total is greater than the dealer total, but they haven't busted, then the player wins. Um, but if the dealer total is greater than the player total, and I'm adding a space there and make that neat, then then the dealer wins. You know, if they haven't busted, but their dealer's total is still greater than the player's, but, but they haven't busted. All right, so the, those are all the possible conditions. And then again, we write host. This round of blackjack is now complete. And now well, we're done with the game, right? But we have a deck of cards that's all used up. Cards have been, their Boolean values have been set from false to true, so they've been drawn. The cards have been used. So we need to put everything back into a beginning state, an initial state, right? In case the player decides to play another hand of blackjack. And so we want to go through all the, the, you know, in this case, for the deck of cards, you know, for the max hand size, for the dealer's hand, and we're going to set them all to be null, and the player's hand will, will, will be null. So that just resets the player's hand and the dealer's hand of cards. And then in this method, every time they choose to play a hand, that takes care of rebuilding and you know and repopulating the array of cards with new card objects, which then get re-randomized, uh, you know, once they're built. The, this you know we're gonna draw, and the whole process starts over again. So does that make sense? Now it told me that the dealer busted and I won, but then it also said the dealer wins this round. So I have a logic issue here. It's syntactically correct, but logically, I'm not doing something right, right? It's, it's, it's a human error. So what did I code? You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't code my logic right here. What, what's going on? Well, right here is the block of code. This is if the player bust or the dealer busts, right? But then down here, I have another block of code if the player stays, and then we look at the totals. And if the player is equal to the dealer, they tie. But otherwise, if the player total is greater than the dealer total, you know, the player wins this round. And, but if the dealer total is greater than the player total, then the dealer wins this round. But the problem is, is that my logic is not complete here. Normally that would be true, right? That logic would work. But the problem is if the dealer busts, the dealer had 23 points. So they lost, they went over 21. And I didn't code my logic to deal with that effectively. So that was a mistake that I made. See, I'm only checking to see if their total's greater than my total. Well, yeah, they had 23 and I had 20. So it's saying the dealer wins this round, but the dealer didn't, the dealer busted. So what I've got to do is add an and. I need to and another condition into the test portion of my else ifs, okay? So basically what I want to say is, and the deal total is less than or equal to 21. So if they bust, I don't care if their point value is higher than mine. If they busted, they lost. Remember, and says both sides have to be true. So it have to be greater than my total and less than or equal to 21. And if I did that, that'll stop this from happening when the dealer uh, busts. But I, I need to do the same thing for me too, right? Otherwise, if I bust, I lose. And the dealer would win, but but my logic is too simple here. It doesn't account for that. I've, I've left it out, so I'd have to add that in. And I'll just copy and paste it. And I want to make that a player total. So I want to do the same thing here. You, you follow? Are you with me? Before I say the player wins, it's not enough to say that are they just greater than the dealer. I also have to say, but they also cannot have busted. They have to be less than or equal to 21. So sort of compounding that logic there. But I, I figured it'd be good to share that in the video just to kind of give you an idea of, of you know, that's not a syntax issue, but that's, a lot of times you code something, you know, syntactically it, it works, but the logic, you know, it's, it doesn't do what you want. And so you have to be able to step through the code and kind of follow the program flow and say, well, what's going on? Why 
why is my program not doing what I want it to, you know? All right, so we changed or modified those values. I'm gonna hit F5, run again. And all right, enter and let's play blackjack. All right, making my deck of cards. I have 18, ooh, I'm gonna stay. I'm just gonna stay right here. I have 18, the dealer has 20. The dealer wins this round, and this round of blackjack is now complete, all right? So that looks good. Um, just wanna play till somebody busts here. I'll try to bust on purpose, I guess, just to illustrate. I guess I'll lose on, I'll take one for the team. I'll lose on purpose. Okay, so. And there, I'm busted. Carly, you busted, sorry. Um, so look, the total dealer points is seven. I have 22, so I have greater, and my, my number of points is greater, but it went over 21, so I busted. And it didn't have an ace, so it couldn't be converted to a one. And that way, it doesn't tell me that I won. It only tells me that I, I busted. So that, that does what we want. Changing that logic there does what we want in the game. Thank you.